Now hey, does anybody fine, um, does anybody here use HBO Now? I do. Yeah. How do you, um? Well, I, it's the same thing as HBO Go. Are you? Yeah. Are there any downsides to it? Yeah. Sometimes Game of Thrones stops updating. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Okay. Yeah, very once it was really great before when Game of Thrones every Sunday I'd come back and there was a new Game of Thrones. Then all of a sudden it just stopped spitting out new Game of Thrones and I was like I use this service a lot less. I submitted mm -hmm. a bug report to see if they answer. Interesting. Um Justin, I was just basically giving Terry an overview of the show. And I said about the, the topics, about the discussion topic. Um, did you have any questions that you wanted to bring up pre? Uh, no, no, no. I'm actually fairly familiar with, uh, with, with the basics of, of uh, 23. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to Terry about it. Cool. I mean, one of the I things can't. I would like to do, if possible, was just basically draw similarities to uh, social media companies like Facebook and, and um, Twitter and what have well, you. I think, yeah, not only, I mean, the idea of 23andMe having access and a database of everybody's information, uh, on one hand, very interesting and, and yields tremendous results, but on the other hand, you know, what, what does that mean going forward? And also, like, what if, if previously we didn't really care about, oh, well, we go to this very scary You might need to bring up the audio on your mic, Justin. Is it on your mic, Mike? Check, check, check. Yeah. One, two, three. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, but it's like, you know, what what is the AdWords or pixel tracking of genetic data? Like, mm -hmm. what is that thing that eventually we're like, oh, I guess there is a cost. To this, you know, there, there's mm -hmm. there's a, there's a a cost in the, in the trade-off. And granted, 23andMe isn't free, you know, and, and certainly uh, it it is a really cool benefit. And you know, I'm I'm one of those gung ho folks who thinks that they, they probably should be able to give you more information than the government thinks that they should be allowed to give you. But like, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that that that's that is a conversation. That's one of those like forward-thinking conversations. Forward-thinking. Uh, a lot of those. A lot I, of those. I, I think it, it's really interesting because it is a company that wants to have a collection of personal data. That's really what they're interested in. Um, but it's not for advertising, uh, yeah. which is the, the one thing that makes it really, really different. It's not about uh, selling you stuff, at least not directly. Um, most of the customers are most are, are really interested in taking that data to create better or targeted drugs or therapies, which would then be sold to you. Yeah. And then the question is, you know, even even if it's just for if it's just for drug stuff, if it's just like stuff that is done behind the scenes and no one ever sees it, then it's it's the same for the average consumer as nothing happening, right? Mm -hmm. Uh. I think the question is, will there ever be in the future more retail kinds of services? And whether or not, I mean, advertising is something that we wrap our head around now because, you know, gigantic companies are built on uh, targeted tracking advertising. But if it's not, is there, a, is there a world in which it's actually a higher cost? You know, since, since it is something that is far more personal and really you can get into a lot more troubling kind of uh, uh, allegories of like definition of who we are and and what are mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know the, the the genetic market. I mean, we start to get in those those Gattaca kind of conversations, right? You yeah. Know? Well, the first layer is you know how well are, is the information going to be protected, right? Um, yeah. What could what can people do with it legally now? What can people do with it illegally now? Uh, and what sorts of changes would we have to see in society for that information to uh, uh, to hurt us coming out? Uh, I think a lot of things have to happen for uh, to see sort of disastrous effects, right? Like for the, for the release of that data to be uh, generally a problem. Um, but, you know, having that information uh, can lead to 
a lot of unexpected things coming up. There have been people uh, in 23andMe uh, who have found out about relatives that they didn't know about, um, yeah. and that maybe uh, the the like under knowing that that family member is out there uh, is a difficult thing for a group of people who thought that that was the family to process. Yeah, you know, we did. Um, my wife and I, before we got married, uh, we were joking that it was our 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 final proof to make sure we weren't related. You know, because uh, <laughs> your due diligence. Um, we uh, uh, did uh, ancestry. My, my my wife got into like ancestry and ancestry ancestry dot com does their own genetic marker. You know, spit in a vial, they give you results, kind of thing. And uh, what was really, really interesting is, is, you know, so they're matching that data set with uh, other people who have similar matching genetic data sets that have also done the the twenty or the ancestry.com and also matching it with your your uh, your your family tree, which is uh, you know kind of fascinating. But you know, I guess I mean, like, I think that that's that's one of those things where it's like there is this retail kind of thing, but. All right, so one thing, if it's like, all right, to develop drugs, mm -hmm. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to stop talking because this is all stuff that should be on the show. So yeah. I'm going to ask oh, you. It's, <laughs> so, base, um, Len, is your mic open? Yes, it is. Well, I got to ask hear. you. Oh, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm, not, I'm just sorry. I was just wondering. I was hearing like a little breathing or in and out. Oh. I was just wondering if that was your mic. That might have been me. Hang on a second. Let me turn it off. Right, turn it back on. Was that was that it? Hmm. I'm gonna mute myself during the show. So okay. any, anything. Yeah. Hopefully it's hopefully it was me, and then. Um. So yeah, Terry. That's kind of where the direction of the conversation will go. Is uh, and um, you know, for well, a I lot of ask, people, where where would you go if uh, you did the ancestry thing and you found out your second cousins? But isn't second cousin safe? Aren't second cousins safe? Yeah, but I, I, how how would that affect the relationship? Well, you know, depending, it's it's a very culturally specific uh, mentality about marrying a cousin and stuff. Like, I'll be honest, like Chinese culture, it's not really considered a bad bad thing. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not it's not your first choice, but it's, if it happens, it's not like oh my god, the world at world ends kind of thing. I think you would put a significant. Uh, uh, it would it would put some significant hurdles in in the at the very least in the Western wedding, society. The wedding would have been uh, postponed. I think uh, uh, without that, that's a split second decision. <laughs> you would have to do a little soul searching. <laughs> Luckily, wow. my wife and I look like like literally. My my wife is uh, effectively transparent, and and I have a a very. <laughs> Full complexion. Yeah. Well, my my wife is of a different race, so <laughs> that wasn't an issue. Yeah. Although I said when when we were going when she was going uh, for prenatal care, they did the, a bunch of tests and stuff, you know, genetics to see if the to to, to mark what do they call it panorama testing or something, where they basically try to identify any potential complications because mm -hmm. of genes and stuff like that, which. Which there wasn't, which was great, because the kid came out right. So <laughs> there you go, happy uh, story. Happy story. All right, you ready to I roll? Should, I am gonna mute myself, and then I am going to run uh, the slides. You'll basically see on the screen, Terry, is when the news comes in. You'll see basically full screen web shots of the news stories. Then when you guys start talking, it'll just go back to you too. Okay. With maybe a story or two. That's it. All right. You good to go? Yep. Oh, don't forget you're recording. I'm recording. All right, Len, you muted? I am. All right, cool. The Daily Tech News Show is powered by its audience and not outside organizations. Find out more on how you can support the show by going to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This 
This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 9th, 2016. I'm Justin Robert Young, filling in for the final day while Tom Merritt makes his return trip to our golden shores. Uh, joining me, as always, on Fridays is the one, the only, Len Peralta, who will be drawing the stories. Len, welcome back to the show. Uh, thank you so much. It's so there's this excitement in the air with Tom coming back, but us doing this incredible show with an incredible guest. So I'm all in. So, well, speaking of the incredible guest, let's go ahead and introduce him now. His name is Terry Johnson, co-author of How to Defeat Your Own Clone and Other Tips for Surviving the Biotech Revolution. He is also an associate teaching professor at the uh, at a bio, a, uh, here we go of bioengineering at UC Berkeley. Almost got to the end of it without falling on my own face. Let's give a warm round of applause for Terry Johnson. Welcome, Terry. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having me. Well, we have a, a huge conversation about not only uh, biotech, but also the, the changing and evolving retail future of it coming up a little later in the show. But first, let's go ahead and get into the top stories. Facebook removed a Vietnam-era napalm girl photo called The Terror of War and, sus and suspended the account of a Norwegian writer, Tom Ilglin, who posted it. The photo taken by Nick Oot during the Vietnam War shows a naked nine-year-old girl running away from a napalm attack. The suspension attracted a number of complaints from uh, Aftenposten, Norway's largest newspaper, whose article on Facebook was flagged as indecent and subject to removal, as well as the Norwegian Prime Minister, Erna Hoiberg. Facebook responded that it was a feature, not a bug, stating it's difficult to create a distinction between allowing the photograph of a new child in one instance and not others. Recode now reports that Facebook has retracted the decision and would reinstate the image on Facebook where we are aware that it has been removed. But that it will take some time to adjust these systems. The photo should be available for sharing in the coming days, and the company has made no comments on changes to the policy itself, if any. Terry, this kind of seems like one of those uh, one of those things stories that pops up every once in a while, where the bot with good intentions uh, winds up having a little too good intentions and starts to erode the thing that it is protecting. Uh, having a lot of data is always challenging. doesn't matter what kind of data you're talking about, but uh, once you get to the point where you can't have people examining every piece of information that is coming in that's just, you know, not feasible, uh, you have to make some hard decisions. Uh, and there's always uh, unintended consequences, and I, I think that it's uh, it's tricky, right? I mean, uh, how do you react when your bot, like the I think it was the Microsoft bot, uh, very quickly uh, becomes extremely racist on Twitter? Yeah, and I think that there is a difference between something like that that you could criticize that it was released too early. It's its own little thing. It was attacked, you know, in a, in a certain malicious way. As soon as that becomes corrupted, you take it down and you and you try to retool it. Uh, where something like this, where there are filters that are on a, a lot of content, and whether or not it's internal to Facebook that flags things so somebody else can review it, or automatic, where it uh, detects copyrighted content and says, no, by our standards, you should not be putting up something like this. There is always some level of screening. The question mm -hmm. is getting that screening right in cases where things are automatically removed. And I think that's something that they're going to have to learn here. And whether or not it's some white-listed uh, a, you know, a, a database of photos that include nude children but are deemed artistically worthwhile or historically significant or some other algorithmic way where, you know, you can program the sum total of all knowledge into a machine and it determines whether or not Napalm Girl is different than kitty porn uh, remains to be seen. Hmm. I will say this. There certainly is... In my mind, we should judge Facebook, and, and nobody really wants to cape up for Facebook because they're gigantic, right? But Facebook should be judged by their reaction here and not necessarily what happened. What happened is going to happen. How they reacted to it and the fact that it seems like they've gotten it right, I think is, is should be what we build you know, their reputation with issues like this. I, I think it's important not to... Uh to take responsibility 
Uh, yeah. Because though the code was the one that performed the action, that it's Facebook's code. So uh, I, I'm always a fan when a company takes responsibility for an action and doesn't simply say, eh, it was the bot, what are you going to do? Well, I mean, you know, they, they certainly like to enforce things when, uh, let's say, one of their employees comes up with an idea that, that they contractually have uh, ownership on. So they should also go ahead and take responsibility when some of the code goes awry. Comcast has accused FCC Chairman Tom Wheeler of violating the law with his recent proposal of TV for TV providers to develop and offer apps for subscribers to watch content instead of forcing them to rent set-top boxes. The issue stems from the FCC's proposal for a licensing system between TV providers and third-party device makers. The industry's main lobby group, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, said the current, li the current licensing proposal would be, quote, subject to intrusive FCC oversight and improperly involving the FCC in private licensing agreements. Or, sorry, arrangements. These are the stories that I feel like two years ago, let's say three years ago, before Tom Wheeler and before the net neutrality decisions, we would not care about because these lobbying organizations uh, uh, rail against FCC proposals all the time so they can get them to a certain point that they feel is advantageous to them. If anything, the fact that we're covering this now seems like a ray of optimism that maybe the FCC will push companies like Comcast, which, listen, if nobody wants to cape up for Facebook, less than nobody wants to cape up for Comcast, and maybe bring things a little closer to consumer-friendly, considering how far removed many customers feel about Comcast and a lot of the major telecoms now. But let's stick to what they're talking about. Do you believe that, uh, that uh, Terry, that there is that there should be rather a, a insistence for uh, you know the FCC to, to mandate that Comcast make an app so you could watch it on your Apple TV or your Roku instead of renting the uh, machinery and hardware from Comcast directly? Uh, this pretty far from my field of expertise, uh, yeah. but I I definitely do understand that you have this uh, network. And the network used to be putting out, you know, a very small number of different kinds of data, right? It was uh, voice, right? You, phones. Yeah. Uh, and now there's so many different ways to broadcast. Uh, I mean, this this is being broadcast and it's being recorded, and uh, there's the podcast available. Um, how? Uh, a network that was really designed or came into to being ages ago, uh, how you apply that in uh, a world like today, uh, it's tricky. And I think uh, the rules are, are, are shifting uh, faster than the networks are being replaced, certainly. Well, I mean, and this is primarily Comcast right now makes X amount of money by saying you need to buy a cable box. So when you get cable, don't worry. We're going to have a guy come over. He's going to put it in. We're going to make sure it works. And then subsequently, you are going to pay X amount of money per month that basically says for the privilege of having our hardware in your life, uh, which works so well and is uh, universally praised, he said facetiously, uh, <laughs> uh, you will have to pay us this. Now, you have a lot of these over-the-air set-top, or sorry, well, you have over-the-air channels, and then you have set-top boxes that uh, either have apps like HBO Now or uh, uh, various bundles like Sling that basically the FCC is saying, hey, you should offer something like Sling, mm -hmm. where all these channels that you're already going to offer streaming uh, uh, can now go out over the air uh, through there. Now, Comcast doesn't want to be pushed into doing it. I'm sure that they would probably prefer to not to just rush uh, a random app that just sucks because they'd probably still get persecuted for that. Uh, and now they're fighting it. And again, it's not necessarily that this is odd. This is not in and of itself exactly man bites dog. However, it is interesting that things are moving in this direction. And to stay on the cord cutting, uh, the, the cord cutting carousel, let's go ahead and take this story. In an interview with Recode, Turner CEO John Martin wants to sell streaming subscriptions to its channel and build out the capabilities to move and become capable of offering VOD not only domestically, but globally, 
Martin added that Turner is currently operating on a three-pronged strategy, working with existing distributors like Comcast and Charter, a.k.a. traditional cable companies that uh, pay subscription fees to networks like Turner or companies like Turner for networks like TNT and TBS. Uh, new online streaming distributors like Sling and Hulu, who have similar deals but are in an emerging market, and working to offer their own end-to-end -end solution direct to the consumer. What is interesting about this is, A, a major company like Turner is talking about the idea that this is on their radar, where previously quotes from them were more along the lines of, we don't believe anybody doesn't want cable. And... The idea that it is global, that we might have a future where not everything is hampered by deals that affect regionality, a.k.a. Turner would want to sell to somebody in England and Cambodia the same way do they sell to Atlanta and Miami. Uh, Terry, are, are you uh, are you ever uh, uh, do you ever do you ever wish to, to get a, a, a channel uh, internationally or is it is it exciting to you that that you could uh, maybe uh, uh, get things in in other countries that you wouldn't previously be able to get like BBC or something like that oh yeah love BBC America uh, and I I grew up at a time where uh, if you were really lucky you could catch some of the BBC shows on PBS at about 3 a.m uh, and uh, that's how I saw the original Doctor Who uh, yeah I, it would be great. I, the, I don't know what I'm missing. And I think that that's true of a lot of people in a lot of places. Apple SVP of marketing Phil Schiller says customers who want to listen to their music with wired headphones and charge their iPhone 7 at the same time will, uh, will be able to use the Apple Lightning Dock, which comes with a uh, 3.5 millimeter uh, headphone jack and will only cost you $49.00. To smooth the way for audio jack, uh, audio jackless uh, uh, iPhone 7, Apple is building ear pods, not the, uh, not the wireless AirPods, along with the lightning adapter. But this has been one of the, the bugaboos from that announcement are, are the people who say all the time, every day, I'm always charging my phone and listening to it at the same time. Now, I'm not saying that the people who are making this claim are liars. I am kind of suspicious that this is the most common thing on the planet. And if it is something that is a deal breaker to get a new phone, uh, that, you know, I don't know. I, I feel like people would find a way around this. Now Apple is offering a solution for the low, low price of $49. Uh, is it, are you one of these people uh, that, that listens to your phone and charges it at the same time? I've I've been through. I have a long history of getting used to new cords. Uh, I'm not really worried about it. Uh, and I I remember back when the iPhone came out and it didn't have buttons, and that was a yeah. deal breaker for everybody with a BlackBerry. So life finds a way, as Dr. Ian e. Malcolm teaches us. Boing Boing reports that the EU Court of Justice has ruled that any commercial site that links to a document that infringes copyright is presumed to be party to the infringement. Boing Boing suggests that the ruling could potentially leave those who link to improperly licensed material also liable for monetary damages. The court case of GS Media BV versus Sonoma centers on Playboy magazine uh, photos shot by its Dutch unit uh, so Noma Obd being pro, uh, being posted illegally online and these pictures being linked to GS Media BV. So let's put this in English. You upload something to a site. Not only are you liable for uploading it, but the site is liable for uploading it. Uh, I, you know, that's. This is the kind of story that that Boing Boing is is great at uh, at, at following. I, I you know you got to wonder at the end of the day though uh, how much this holds up, and whether or not if it does, you know uh, the EU has a a a history and reputation to deserve it or not as being anti business friendly. You have to wonder whether or not this is an onerous uh, yoke to put on some sites. Although again. 
not exactly new territory for file sharing sites to deal with copyright claims and restrictions. The White House has named retired Air Force Brigadier General Gregory Towhill as the first federal chief information security officer. The position was announced in February as part of a 19 billion dollar cybersecurity national action plan origin reports a towhill will lead a team that will be responsible for quote helping ensure the right set of policies strategies and practices are adopted across agencies and that conducts periodic cyber stat reviews and federal agencies to ensure that implementation plans are effective and achieve the desired outcome that can be roughly translated in english do we need to be better about cybersecurity? And now there's someone we can blame if something goes wrong. <laughs> so congratulations on the uh, on, on on the uh, the the new hire for uh, Gregory for for uh, Air Force Brigadier General uh, Gregory Towhill. But you know, uh, I think the, the the bigger issue with this is going to be what happens a year into this specific uh, role, as we see where it takes root here in the federal government. Those are your top stories. Of course, we want to thank uh, Filmin123, Isting, and everyone else who participates in our subreddit. You, too, can submit stories and vote for them by visiting to dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Again, that is dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. Big thank you to everybody who did that work over the last two weeks, speaking from the perspective of somebody that has to uh, walk in dad's shoes when Tom Merritt is away, it is certainly, certainly helpful when the community is as active as it is. And i sure I speak for uh, super producer Roger Chang that he appreciates that as well. Let's get into our uh, discussion story. Uh, of course, you are uh, well-versed and this is your, your uh, area of study in, in bioengineering. We... Uh, we right now are in kind of a golden age of these kind of companies, startup companies, bioengineering startup companies having a relationship with more of the retail public, 23 and me, probably the first among equals. Uh, are these kinds of companies the future of healthcare? I think they're part of the future of healthcare. Uh, personal genomics is very new. Uh, the idea of uh, being able to uh, take a look at your genetic code and to determine whether you should be particularly cautious in screening for various kinds of diseases. Uh, I think uh, later on the possibility of uh, being able to know how likely it is that a particular drug is going to work for you um, or a particular treatment is going to work for a given disease. Um, these are the, the kinds of applications that people are looking into. Um, I don't like to say anything like the future of anything because I'm hoping that the future of medicine uh, is better in 10 or 20 or 30 different ways uh, or more. Uh, but I think that this is a part of it. 23 and Me seem to get very, very hot, very, very fast. Uh, it, was, it was a company that almost immediately owned Mindshare, especially in the, the technology sector of uh, America, but also seems to have sort of broken through a little bit as just a thing that you do. Why do you think it got so popular so fast? Uh, it's new. Uh, that, the, it was the first opportunity for people who had been reading a lot about genetics for years uh, to participate, uh, to be part of that, and to explore not just in you know, articles in the popular press what genes mean and what they don't mean, um, but what their genes mean. You know, it, it seems to me that there is, is often kind of a pushback to stuff like this, that for every uh, a bot that we think will be super cool or a self-driving car, we also immediately dwell on Skynet or a, a automated car running over a child. For whatever reason, it seems like we've kind of skipped over some of the, the, the dire elements of a company hoarding uh, large amounts of personal genetic information uh, do you think people should be more concerned with that element of companies like 23andMe and, and personal genomics in general? I think that they should be aware. Uh, you should certainly be aware of where the data goes and uh, what is going to be done with the data. 
Um, but uh, if you were to compare, for example, Facebook from one yeah. of the previous stories, um, the they're pretty non-transparent, right? You don't necessarily know exactly what your data is uh, being used for, and uh, you're certain that it's being used to sell you stuff, right? Uh, yeah. Or to help other people to sell you stuff. Um, I think in personal genomics, just like any sort of sharing of personal information, whether that be genetic or browsing habits, um, know what you're getting into and how it's likely to be used. You mentioned earlier that part of that use uh, for, for those data sets are... Uh, selling it to drug companies so they can better understand how certain things could be designed to react with certain, uh, you know, um, data, I mean, for people, right? Uh, so, so drugs can be more effective. Is that something that you think people are, are aware of or will we become more aware of it? Or is, I, I would assume that there are some people listening to this that think, well, I don't know how to feel. You know, I don't know if this is good or, or, or bad. What is your personal feeling on stuff like that? I think that that's likely to change when uh, genetic testing becomes more of uh, your standard medical workup. You know, people talk about, oh, I'm taking statins because uh, I got a blood test, and the blood test told me something about cholesterol levels. Um, it, I think that there'll be clarity or more clarity with most people, if we get to a point, and I hope that we do, where you go to the doctor and as part of those tests, they look uh, at your genes and say, okay, so we've got, uh, for the issue that you have, we have a selection of seven or eight drugs that we can use, and we've done uh, a genotyping that strongly suggests that, you know, drug number three is probably the best one for you, and if that doesn't work, we'll start with drug number four. Do you think that in general, people have just a great sense of what biotech even is right now. That that a general a general populace uh, really even has their their head wrapped around the the ups and downs and the possible pratfalls of of you know, not only personal genomic but really just biotech in general. That if we can have a company like Theranos get as far as as they did before, there were people trying to poke holes in, in the press, uh, it, it almost seems to me, and, and I would certainly be guilty of it personally, that as much as I'm interested in biotech, and I feel, I feel like I read a lot in biotech, that maybe I don't really have a great grasp of it in general. Uh, so Theranos is a diagnostics company. Uh, sure. And uh, the, the 23andMe started out talking about diagnostics and has pulled back from that. They actually had some pretty serious issues with the FDA um, in that they were towing the line for diagnosing. Uh, and if you were to go to the 23andMe uh, webpage today, you'll note that they're focused less on uh, the diagnosis. They're not trying to give you results that will tell you whether you're likely to be a disease, but they're interested in tests that will determine whether you're a carrier. Yeah. Uh, so that they would be the kind of tests that you would take uh, to then discuss with your doctor, um, especially if you were considering having children. Um, Theranos was straight up a diagnostic. You would take a yeah. blood test that would tell you whether you needed to go to the hospital right now. Uh, so it's different stakes, uh, different sort of time scales, and uh, also how these things are marketed, how you talk about these tests to the people uh, that you want to buy them. I guess that's the thing, is that 23andMe, and, and despite the fact that they've gone away from it now, did start out, that was kind of the hook, was that find out whether or not you are more likely to to get a certain disease. Famously, obviously, Sergey Brin, who used to be married to the CEO, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, with, was taking on drastically different habits in his, in his uh, life because he felt like he was marked for death at a certain age based on the information that he got back. And then you have Theranos come by, which seems like, oh, okay, well, that seems like that's, from, from a layman's perspective, obviously, there were very, very key differences. You're like, oh, okay, well, look, this, this does this on a long term, this does this on a short term, and then next thing you know, you realize, from a layman's perspective, you have no idea whether or not what, was, what Theranos was saying was anywhere near plausible or possible, you know, that, that they were vastly overstating what they could do. Uh, that was a bit of a side jack. Let, let, let's get back to the, the hoarding of 
data. I'm, I'm curious to look kind of forward that, of course, all right, now let's say 23andMe sells certain amounts of data to Pfizer so because Pfizer wants to develop a certain drug, and so they're basically requesting certain data sets to make it better. From the end user's perspective, I don't know whether or not that's looked at, especially if it's anonymized and it's just person one, person two, uh, that that's much of an issue. If they secure it, I think that's another step forward. But let's say we go 20 years in the future and we start to get into some of this Gattaca sort of questions. And now it's not Pfizer looking for data on, on uh, uh, how people would react to drugs, but rather Quicken Loans, who wants to know whether or not you are likely to live uh, you know, to, to survive, to pay a, a certain mortgage length or something like that. Where do you think those lines are where people are like, on, on one hand, ah, whatever, if it's anonymized, it's fine. And then on the other hand, uh, well, no, this, this affects my life. And the way that we think of genetic markers is permanence, right? You are, you are defined forever based on what you would you know, see in these genetic tests. And I think that that's probably the most important thing for us to be thinking of as a society is to have humility. When we talk about uh, genetic causes, there's actually very few uh, situations where you can say, ah, you're going to get this disease. Yeah. The reality is pretty much all the time you're talking statistics, right? Uh, for an individual, uh, it's going to be a slightly higher risk. And sometimes the risk is extremely slight. Uh, sometimes it's significant enough to talk to uh, with your doctor, um, which means that uh, from the standpoint of a society, one of the things that is most important is to talk about these things, right? And to make sure that uh, we push against this idea that your genes really do define you. They're part of a very big equation. From your perspective, is there a troubling trend in kinds of businesses or industries that sites like Ancestry or 23andMe are selling data to or might be interested in selling data to or giving data over in the case of the federal government? Uh, in terms of the data, not to my knowledge. Um, I think 23andMe a couple of months ago released that they had had uh, four or five requests from law enforcement. Uh, to take a look at the data, all of which were resisted. Um, and I think reasonably, probably not terribly useful. Um, uh, but that's in part because of the kind of data that 23andMe collects. Um, in terms of things that worry me, I, I think that the direction that 23andMe has taken makes me feel a little bit better about this in that... Uh, Instead of following the model, which a lot of tech companies follow, which is get a big market share um, and then deal with consequences, um, that's not something you can do in medical tech, right? You can't skirt the line of being a diagnostic and just hope that you get too big for the FDA to say anything because the, there is no that big. The FDA is going to say something if you're making claims that are inappropriate based on the kinds of tests that you're doing. Um, and the fact that 23andMe was forced by the system to adjust, uh, I think is really important and critical. I think this has been an illuminating discussion. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Terry, for answering uh, my, my questions. I, I try to represent, uh, you know, so the, the, the people that are, are uh, you know, wouldn't normally try to ask the dumb questions. I am just that dummy, and I'm, uh, I'm happy that you answered my questions very patiently. There are no dumb questions, and these are, are things that we all need to decide, right? We, we, uh, they shouldn't be up to just scientists or engineers or people that you know, work for these companies. We should think about them uh, uh, as a whole, like what we should be thinking about genes. So uh, I'm happy to discuss. Well, thank you so much. Let's get into our messages of the day. Harold sent us an email regarding last Friday's topic on planned obsolescence. Uh, specifically, he mentions that Scott and Annalie made about modular cell phones. He writes, or uh, obsolescence, sorry, I screwed that one up. Uh, specifically, he mentions Scott and Annalie made about modular cell phones. He writes, hi, the ethical modular phone does exist already. It's called the Fairphone 2. So head on over there, fairphone.com, if you want to follow up about that modular cell phone. It is a smartphone with social values. 
It says there on the site. So go ahead and check it out. Robbie in very humid Arkansas writes, I am not from the South, but I've lived here for over a decade and have met some fantastic, smart, and capable people. And yes, many of them have undeniably Southern accents. Thank you for having a knowledgeable and intelligent guest on your show with a Southern accent. Uh, it will hopefully serve as a reminder to listeners that there are more voices in the U.S. tech than on the coast. Love the show. Hey, I am always, as a, as a proud representative from the Sunshine State of Florida, I am, I am a huge, huge fan of pointing out that not all tech exists in San Francisco. And it was something that I was bringing up with my friends at Four Barrel just this morning. Uh, if you have any thoughts on today's show or if you have a software service or hardware pick that you'd like to share with us, send them on over to feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Well, we're rounding the corner here on our final show without merit. Let's go ahead and check in with Len and his artwork. Len, what do you got for us? Well, you know, if you ever want to feel completely inferior it's listening to someone like Terry talk about something as awesome as 23andMe. And my reaction to that is to draw something that's a little bit less intelligent. <laughs> so, um, just a real quick for the audio viewer or audio listeners. Um, it's uh, There's a gentleman who looks a lot like Terry holding on to a test tube. Out comes this weird creature and the guy saying, I spit into a test tube. This is what came back. Can I sue? So... Uh, very interesting. And, and then I assume that is me in my, in my Igor hoodie. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. At the very last second, I decided to, to turn you into, yeah, have a little hoodie and you looked a little bit freaky. So yeah, so you're in the corner. It's been a while since I've been able to draw people from the show into the, uh, uh, into the, uh, images. So there uh, you go. As always, it is fantastic. And the speed at which you draw these is just staggering. Uh, where can people find this image if they're listening to it on audio? Well, they can go to lenperaltastore.com. It's actually on the front page right now if you want to purchase it uh, for sale. The other thing you can do is if you want, uh, you can uh, go check out my Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash len. If you back the DTNS lover level, you will get each and every one of these images I do on Fridays. Uh, as part of your reward. So you'll get a digital copy of them, uh, much more economical than, uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, eco-friendly as well. I don't have to print out a piece of paper, send it out to you. Uh, it's, a, it's a good way to do it. So consider that patreon.com forward slash Len or lenperaltstore.com. I would also suggest as we get in to the, the fall and winter seasons, it makes a tremendous gift for somebody that you know and love that loves the show. Go ahead and subscribe uh, on, on Lens Patreon and make sure that they get that image each and every Friday when they didn't even have to ask. That's right. Uh, let's go ahead and give a big thanks to Terry Johnson again. His a book that he has co-authored, How to Defeat Your Own Clone and Other Tips for Surviving the Biotech uh, Revolution. Uh, Terry, is there anywhere else that you... A writer, people can contact you, or a best way to buy the book. Oh, I am on Twitter at Terry D Johnson, and uh, Amazon.com is a great way to buy the book. I'll tell you this: if you listen to to Terry explain uh, uh, in in his awesome way uh, all these issues, and then you go and buy the book, go ahead and and support the guests that come on this show by leaving a review. I know that that's always a huge thing on Amazon. Once you're done reading it, go ahead and say, I listened to him on DTNS. I bought the book and I couldn't be happier about it. And if you didn't Wait. like it, then stay away from the review section. Forget <laughs> it. Uh, thank you again, Terry, very, very much. You are awesome. Thanks. Speaking of patrons, you can head on over to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support and support our Patreon. That is patreon.com slash DTNS. Or if you don't, that's not your bag, buy a mug. That's not your bag, tell a friend. Review us on any podcasting platform that you particularly listen to. Uh, and also, if you just want the headlines in a day for less than uh, 10 minutes of your time, then you can subscribe to Daily Tech Headlines at dailytechheadlines.com. Of course, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. Catch the show live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern time at Alpha Geek Radio and DiamondClub.tv and visit our website, dailytechnewsshow.com. The old boy, Tom Merritt, is back on Monday, and he is joined by Veronica Belmont. Thank you guys for dealing with us. Substitute teachers, we will see you then.
is part of the Frog Pants Studios Network. For more information about this and other shows, visit frogpants.com. Audio program so good, it's like you're there. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> And we're out. Awesome. Great show, guys. That was awesome. It was uh thank you for scrambling, Justin. I know with the uh the weird happenstance with the oh, uh, the yeah. internet. Yeah, no, my internet went out. Uh it took <laughs> a dump like uh right before and then I, I took a uh a screenshot and threw it just because I know as if Roger needs another data point to, to freak out <laughs> while we're in total crisis mode. I just said what looked like uh, a, a meteorological reading of two hurricanes hitting San Francisco and Oakland <laughs> at the same time, which was Comcast's uh, data outage map uh, that they have on their, their, their detection thing. And I was literally about to run out, go across the street to Brett the Amtrek around Seville's apartment because I know he's on UVerse. Uh, and right as I was grabbing everything and putting it in a bag, I saw, you know, the little flicker start going and I'm like, Oh my God, let me go check. It. <laughs> Fair enough it was. But I oh feel, my God. I feel so, like the adrenaline, the adrenaline made the show better. It did. <laughs> it, there, there was like, you know, we got a second chance at doing this podcast. Let's not waste it. That uh, is. speaking of waste, let's not waste the wonderful titles that ever, all the viewers have, uh, so generously created yeah. for our voting and absolutely and, and terry uh, uh feel free uh, from this point on we're just going to do uh process stuff but but thank you one more time for being on the show whenever oh, you, yeah. you need to tap out yeah. feel free um, um i i should probably get back to work um uh, thanks again for the opportunity this was fun um i uh am going to go download that picture of me uh immediately yes. <laughs> i'm i'm not the purple one right no. No, you are not the purple okay. one. <laughs> Ooh, I was worried about that. Um, uh, and, uh, yeah, I, I had a moment when the issues were happening in the beginning where I was trying to figure out how would I close the window if everybody else got dropped, right? Like, just I saw everybody go away, and I know it's just me. Yeah. Uh, uh, how do you stop this? <laughs> Uh, again, thanks again, uh, and have a good uh, have a good weekend. Absolutely, yes, you too. Thank you have so much. Uh, all right, we have the Facebook, Facebook of War. Of war. Uh, I, I think I don't know. Let's let's stay away from any of the the the, the napalm child yes. uh, uh, club uh, references. Uh, there's a clean up the house. Tom is coming back <laughs> because you might get this disease. We thought you'd like these products. I thought that was actually pretty good. Um, <laughs> Your DNA shows you're like, it receives a bam. That's a good one too. Uh, so 23 and misled. Uh, is that your DNA in my, in your portfolio? <laughs> 20,000 genes in your pocket. Uh, DNA co uh, colon data. Nah, what is that? Naively. naively acquired. Always check the ancestry. I'll take drug number three for a thousand. <laughs> um, you know, so, I, I, I kind of like because you might get this disease, we thought you'd like these. Products. I really, I really like that. I think that it's too funny. long because if it's not too long, I think that's the winner. I think I'm going to go with that. All right. uh, I will add that, you know, it. you guys had a great discussion. That was, it just occurred to me that in some cultures, um, knowing your ancestry is considered to be a very, uh, a, a, not privileged, but a, a very accomplished thing to do. Like being able to name your ancestors, at least down the your patriarchal line, like yeah. five, if, you know, 10, 15, 20 generations down is a mark of pedigree. Like, like I'm related to this famous king or someone, you know, like everyone says, I'm, yeah, a, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm a descendant of Charlemagne. Um, and it's, it'll be interesting to see if things like 23andMe will have competitors that will basically fudge results for um, customers. So they could say potentially apply for, yes, I'm a descendant of a king, a sultan or, or vizier or whatever of some famous period in human history so they could 
falsely garner the acclaim or prestige that would come. Well, from that would be a weird thing, right? Because you would have to have a platform that was respected enough that you could just print off a thing and people would care about it, right? Mm -hmm. And yet ethically flexible enough to 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 fudge something. Like so so that's I mean because otherwise just get it from 23 and me or ancestry and just, you know, uh you go ahead into Photoshop and and uh, you know, make yourself a son of Henry the 8th. I mean like well how many how far along would 23 and me need to be? to garner that level of, of notoriety where they could someone like maybe the fifth CEO says, Hey, you know what? We need to, we need to pad our pad out our quarter. Let's, let's offer a, an additional service where we could, you know, maybe find force a connection as it were. I mean, that, I, I don't think that, that, that to me seems about as likely as, as you know, the, the, as, as an accounting firm saying, let's also offer a bonus where we can, you know, cook the books a little bit. Like, like once you start treading on your reputation. You know, I think the Panama Papers have proved a lot of that to be pretty Oh, no, no, no. Than... Listen, it happened. <laughs> but when they, when, when those accounting firms are revealed to, to have been doing it, very few survive. And, of course, you know, the, the ultimate question is, how do you not get caught? And that's that's the true, I think, the yeah. genius of that. But speaking of true genius, uh, thank you everyone for supporting us these past two weeks while Tom has been out. You yes. guys have been great, especially in the chat room. Super helpful, all of you. Uh, but I will have to say goodbye to you folks on AGR. I'm going to take you off air, and then I am going to stop the broadcast. Thank you again. Uh, Tom is back Monday with Veronica.